Uh, it's my pleasure to contribute to the UN UGGI policy dialogue series on the triple planetary crisis. Um, I hope you'll take away from my presentation a clear understanding of what the right to healthy environment is and why it is essential to effective action to protect people on the planet from the triple planetary crisis of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. If you bear with me a moment, I'm just gonna um, share my screen. If you can confirm for me that you're seeing the PowerPoint, that would be fantastic. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. So, um, at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we're working to put human rights at the center of environmental action. Uh, we've been part of uh, an environmental, a global environmental justice movement to gain recognition of the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, here I have a quote from our former High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, our, our current High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, uh, joined the office about a month and a half ago, um, and, and we'll, we'll be updating uh, to share more current uh, quotes in the future. He's already delivered quite a few, um, emphasizing how important the right to a healthy environment and rights-based environmental action is uh, to him and, and, and to the office. Um, I'll just flag that uh, he played a very active role as well in terms of engaging with the negotiations of the 27th Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and I'll be coming to that shortly. Um, I do uh, imagine, you know, I, I do want to keep this quote and, and keep the reference to, to High Commissioner, former High Commissioner Bachelet um, in everybody's mind because she played an absolutely critical role as one of the first United Nations principles to actively call for global recognition of the right to a healthy environment, along with UNEP Executive Director uh, Inger Anderson. And, um, and, and, and I think it's important we, we uh, continue to acknowledge that role. Um, in the face of environmental harm and injustice, Bachelet said, the law is one of our most effective tools to hold governments to account, to uphold our rights, and to protect human health and the Earth's natural systems. And that's really what the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is about. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about OHCHR's role in promoting rights-based environmental action. Uh, I'm then going to go through the evolution of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment over time um, and its key elements. Um, and we will conclude with some information about uh, Guyana and, and the recognition of the right to a healthy environment in Guyana. Uh, as well as a question and answer. And, and I, I hope we have plenty of time for question and answer. I'll, I'll try not to, to take too long on the initial presentation um, and, and feel free to share questions now uh, as they come to mind. So OHCHR works to support the inclusion of civil society and affected individuals and peoples and environmental decision-making processes. Uh, ensure access to information and effective remedies for those affected by environmental harms. We support the human rights mechanisms and their work to address environmental issues. That includes the special procedures mechanisms of the Human Rights Council. Uh, there's a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment. There's a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Toxics. There's one on Human Rights and Climate Change. There are a number of other special procedures mechanisms uh, quite relevant to the right to a healthy environment, including on food, water and sanitation, 
the rights of indigenous peoples, so on and so forth. Uh, the office supports all of these mandates uh, and works with them and UN system partners to advance the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. We also support the human rights treaty bodies. So those are the bodies of experts that monitor um, and provide advice and, and can also, in many cases here, petitions related to the effective enjoyment of human rights um, with respect to their different, uh, the, the different treaties, um, the different core human rights treaties. Um, so the, as an example, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which um, is the human rights treaty body for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, is currently in the process of developing a general recommendation on children's rights in the environment. Um, and, and that general recommendation uh, will have important, uh, important um, is an important articulation of the rights of children in the context of uh, the convention with respect to the environment. Um, we also work to and advocate on behalf of environmental human rights defenders and to support efforts by the UN system to protect them. We conduct research and advocacy to address human rights harms caused by environmental degradation. And we work to integrate human rights and environmental action by integrating human rights in the implementation of international environmental agreements. So here I'll, I'll come back to uh, our recent work with respect to the 27th Conference of the Parties of the UNFCCC shortly. Um, and by collaborating with other UN agencies working on themes related to environmental action to integrate a human rights-based approach in their work. So a human rights-based approach analyzes human rights obligations inequalities and vulnerabilities and seeks to address discriminatory practices and unjust distributions of power. It anchors plans, policies, and programs in a system of rights and corresponding obligations established by international law. Accountability, transparency, and meaningful and informed participation can strengthen environmental policies and programs making them more ambitious, effective, inclusive, responsive, and collaborative while ensuring that they leave no one behind. So that's why we uh, advocate for a human rights-based approach. Uh, and it's why the international community has agreed to a human rights-based approach. And, and states everywhere, and in fact, all states have ratified at least one of the major core human rights treaties. Most states have ratified uh, many um, and, and some all of the, the core human rights treaties. Um, the specific elements of the rights based approach include identifying rights holders and their entitlement. Rights holders is a, a way of saying people, essentially. Um, people are rights holders, and um, we work to ensure that people have their rights upheld, um, respected, protected, and fulfilled. It involves identifying duty bearers and clarifying their obligation. Um, duty bearers are states, uh, first and foremost. States have an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights, but they also include non-state actors as well. So businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights. Um, the human rights duties of businesses are articulated by the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And it works to integrate human rights in environmental laws, policies, and programs. So mainstreaming human rights in environmental laws can help ensure policy coherence and rights-based action in the environmental sphere. So the right to a healthy environment is the basis of uh, the work of my team at OHCHR. Uh, it is increasingly recognized. Um, I mentioned. Uh, well, so more than 150 countries recognize the right through their national, regional, uh, through their national or regional legislation. Um, in the case of Guyana, uh, Guyana uh, both recognizes the right to a healthy environment through its constitution, 
but also as a uh, signatory and party to the Escazú Agreement. Um, the Human Rights Council in its resolution 48-13 recognized the human right to a healthy environment in October of last year. The United Nations General Assembly in its resolution 76-300 recognize the human right to a healthy environment in July of this year. So both of those resolutions uh, were very exciting developments for the environmental justice movement, which has been pushing for this universal recognition for many, many years. So the elements of the right to a healthy environment are important. And they include a safe and stable climate, which is essential for humanity's survival and crucial to our efforts to stay healthy, to grow food, water crops, preserve our homes. To protect human rights, we have to stabilize the climate. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll come back to climate. Uh, that's, that's the area that OHCHR has been working on uh, the longest, and, and I'll be sharing uh, more information on that shortly. Um, healthy ecosystems are another critical element of the right to a healthy environment. The effective enjoyment of a wide range of human rights, including the rights to health, water, uh, food, cultural rights, all depend on healthy ecosystems and biodiversity. Healthy ecosystems are also an important uh, resilience mechanism in the face of climate change and other hazards. A non-toxic environment. Stopping pollution uh, and related environmental degradation will save lives and prevent human rights violations. So air pollution alone kills roughly 7 million people each year. If anything else, were that deadly, there would be a massive mobilization to stop it. Now, we haven't seen nearly enough action to address air pollution or other elements of the triple planetary crisis, biodiversity loss or climate change. Pollution is the largest source of premature death in the developing world and it disproportionately affects small children, older people, persons with disabilities, and those who live in situations of poverty or marginalization. This is true of all of the elements of the triple planetary crisis. They are disproportionately affecting the people who are least responsible for environmental degradation and often have the fewest resources to adapt to it. The last element um, that, that I'll go into right now of the right to a healthy environment is justice and inclusion. We all have the rights to participation, access to information, and access to justice in environmental matters. This is reflected in principle 10 of the Rio Declaration. It's also uh, reflected in the Escazú Agreement and in the uh, Aarhus Convention, which are regional agreements uh, protecting the rights to participation, access to information, and access to justice, and uh, protecting, sorry, I have motion sensitive lights, so give me a moment, there we go, and protecting uh, environmental human rights defenders. So I do wanna say a few words about environmental human rights defenders. Um, they are uh, a key line of defense between people, humanity, society, the planet, and environmental degradation. And unfortunately for, for their efforts, they're often subject to retaliation, attacks, harassment. Their families may be as well. Um, and in, in many cases, uh, extra, extrajudicial execution and killing. Um, we are working extensively uh, within the UN system to 
support effective measures to better protect environmental human rights defenders who are, uh, in many cases, our last line of defense um, against the triple planetary crisis. Um, I just want to share a specific example of uh, one environmental defender with whom OHCHR and UNEP have worked uh, quite closely with uh, collectively in Kenya. Uh, Phyllis Omido is a Goldman Prize winner. Uh, she mobilized her community against a uh, toxic smelter, um, which was leading to um, widespread problems in the health of uh, in the health of her community across generations. Um, Phyllis and her community with with support from the UN Human Rights Office and, and others, um, effectively uh, litigated for closure and access to remedy um, related to the pollution caused by, uh, by toxic lead smelting in, in Owino Uhuru. Um, this is one of many examples. She faced death threats. She faced harassment. Um, she's been incredibly successful, brave, and courageous in, in uh, persevering in the face of those threats uh, and, and securing um, positive results and outcomes for her community. Uh, there are many stories of environmental human rights defenders that unfortunately do not end so well. And, and as much as we can talk about this story um, and, and appreciate the that in some small way justice was served by the results. There's still a lot of work to do to implement uh, the the judicial um, decision with respect to the case of the we know Uhuru community. And there's there's no remedying the kinds of harm that have been experienced by the people of that community uh, because of toxic lead pollution. Um, so really when we're talking about these issues we we there are things we can do and and there are there are some things that that are are essentially um irredeemable um and and i think it's important as well that that we be aware of the fact that the damage humanity is doing um to the environment uh is is in some cases uh not fixable and we have to come to terms with that as well and and figure out the best approach to try to to remedy uh the harms that that have been inflicted on people um so i said i'd say a few words about the right to a healthy environment in guiana um as i already mentioned it's in the constitution um every citizen has a duty to participate in activities designed to improve the environment and protect the health of the nation and the well-being of the nation depends on preserving clean air, fertile soils, pure water, and the rich diversity of plants, animals, and ecosystems. And everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to his or her, or her health or well-being. Uh, Guiana has also ratified the Escazú Agreement, which protects the rights to participation, access to justice, and access to information in environmental matters. Um, Guiana is, uh, Guiana, so the, sorry, the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council is, is one of the ways that the, the human rights record of all countries are considered and addressed through a periodic peer review process. Um, so here I'm just sharing some of the recommendations that came out of the last cycle of the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council for Guyana. Uh, you can see both the recommendation and the government that contributed that recommendation through the peer review process. You can also see in the, the right-hand column that each of these recommendations was supported. Um, and in essence, that means agreed to um, follow up by the, the government of Guyana. 
So one was to continue to, and to ensure that its climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction measures pay due consideration to vulnerable uh, people, including women, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples. Another was to intensify efforts to have laws and policies in place to ensure oil and petroleum production will not contribute to climate change and adversely affect biodiversity and will therefore not compromise the right to life. Um, advance efforts to achieve climate resilience, adopt international best practices in environmental protection during the production and exportation of oil and natural gas, take into account the specific needs of vulnerable persons, including women, children, and persons with disabilities, and its programs on issues related to climate change, and review its policy on climate change and energy in order to prevent um, possible natural disasters and environmental degradation resulting from extractive activities and the consequent emissions of greenhouse gases from having a disproportionate effect on women and children, mainly those living in poverty. So these are some examples of how other states have interpreted uh, the human rights-based approach in its application to the environmental context of Guyana. Um, and I think they're, they're a pretty good uh, representative uh, sampling of the kinds of policies and recommendations uh, that should be considered um, in that context. Um, so the, the last thing I said I would, I would uh, cover a bit more extensively, um, and that's because it's the area that the office has been working on the longest, um, and, and also where we've had the most recent developments and the, the climate negotiations. Um, I'm not going to go through all the slides that I have here, um, and I'll be happy to share the, the PowerPoint presentation um, for, for your information, uh, should that be helpful. Because basically what I have at the, the end of this presentation is a number of slides with reference materials and information materials where you can find additional information about the work of the Human Rights Council on climate change, about the human rights-based approach to environmental action in different contexts, and about um, human rights and climate change more generally. Um, I'm going to skip, uh, as I said, presenting those and, and rather share a few insights from the latest climate negotiations, uh, which took place, um, well, they ended on the, what was it, the 19th of November, uh, not long ago, or the 20th, I think they went over. Um, but OHHR was there. I, I was there um, for not the duration, but but members of my team were there for for the entire time. And there was an extensive discussion of human rights in a number of different contexts. Um, there was also a focus on loss and damage, uh, which is an important human rights issue that really relates to access to justice and effective remedy. In, in human rights terms, loss and damage is about access to justice and effective remedy, which is a right that all people have um, for the harms caused by climate change. So one of the very important outcomes of COP27 was that states agreed to establish a new fund on loss and damage. Now, where it gets a little bit more difficult is that they couldn't really agree on the scope of that fund, who would contribute to it, and who would benefit from it. And what they agreed to instead is to create a transition committee that would work on the rules and recommendations for operationalization of the fund um, to be adopted at the next conference of the parties which will take place in the United Arab Emirates in November and December of next year. So that was one important outcome. Um, another important outcome from a human rights perspective is that 
the parties included a explicit reference to the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, emphasizing that states should respect, promote, and consider the right to a healthy environment when taking climate action and the cover decision of, of the, the conference of the parties. Um, one of the more disappointing outcomes of the 27 Conference of the Parties to UNFCCC was the failure of it to agree on language about ambition that would step up ambition, phase out fossil fuels, um, and, and help keep 1.5 uh, in reach. So 1.5 degrees Celsius is the, the um, most ambitious target contained in the Paris Agreement. It is not um, a human rights compliant target, and, and I think that's important to note. Um, at 1.1 degrees, or whatever we're at right now, somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2, the human rights impacts of climate change are already catastrophic. Tens of millions of people are being displaced each year. It's affecting people's access to food and water on a massive scale. It's contributing to the transmission of vector-borne diseases. The impacts of climate change right now on the effective enjoyment of human rights are far too high. That said, uh, the, the sort of political reality is that 1.5 is the most ambitious target on the table. Um, and, and therefore, that's the target that, that we, we are all aiming for um, and, and that will be better than, than additional warming beyond that uh, from, a, from a human rights perspective. Um, so there, there was not progress made on ambition um, and that poses a, a very substantial threat to the effective enjoyment of human rights now uh, and in the future. Um, the international community needs to drastically step up action in order to respect, uh, protect, and fulfill human rights um, and, and protect people from climate change. Um, I think that I'll stop there because I, I want to save time for question and answer. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention.